Hello, Houston. Hello, world. This is John Henry with Pacifica Business Talk, 90.1 FM on your dial. The email for the show is johnhenryradio at yahoo.com. Just like it sounds, give us a call, uh, give us an email to comment on the show or if you want to be on the show. Today, we're very pleased to have Charlie Watkins with the restaurant Blue Agave, fantastic Mexican restaurant here in Houston. Welcome, Charlie. How are you doing today? Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon, Houston. All right, all right. It's great to be here. Fantastic. I, I have wanted to do a restaurant show since we started the show in January, so I'm glad, so glad you're here. Charlie is the owner of Blue Agave. Uh, tell us a little bit about the restaurant, and we're going to get a lot into it, but, but give us a, a, a bird's eye view. I'm happy to. Blue Agave is located on... Uh, basically on the corner of Highway 6 and I-10 on Grisby Road. It's across from the original Loopy Tortillas and La Montes and the Ale House. Nice little restaurant road out there. And it's a really special uh, location in the sense I've got like a 20,000 square foot patio. We can do, you know, parties of 100, 200 at the same, 100 and 200 at the same time outside. We see it about 150 people inside. It's a beautiful, beautiful restaurant location and uh, some excellent, excellent Mexican food. Fantastic. Tell us a little bit about the menu and what were, what were some of your ideas about the menu and uh, have you, have you operated uh, Mexican restaurants before? Yes. Uh, actually, this restaurant uh, on Highway 6 was started by a friend of mine, Brian Smith, uh, and he, and a group of his. He was struggling for a name, and he asked me, and my old restaurant name for a Mexican restaurant I had in 98 and early 2000s was called Blue Agave. And I said, hey, take my old name. It's much better than the ones you've been tossing around. <laughs> and uh, he said, oh, I love that. So Brian took that, and then he operated it for approximately two years and, and called me and said, this is a lot of work. Can you help me? <laughs> I'll bet it's a lot of work. I, I have uh, worked at the lowest level of restaurants. I was at uh, – Pino's restaurant in the 70s, right there on on Westheimer and Hillcroft, and I was a dishwasher and busboy. I graduated to busboy from dishwasher. They let me out into the restaurant. It's terrible, terrible hard work. Maybe I call it terrible, but how hard do you work in the restaurant business as as an owner of a restaurant? Uh, Very, very hard. I mean, I've been doing it for 40 plus years, so I've gotten very organized and and can take more time off than most. But I spent probably 10 plus years working over 100 hour weeks. Oh, my goodness. And, uh, you know, learning the business, get, you know, trying to make everything work when I first got started. I've had a lot of restaurants over the years, but now now I've gotten where I can uh, train and delegate a lot better, so I have a much easier life uh, these days than I did when I started. Like, what are the hours of Blue Agave? Do you all do lunch and dinner? Yeah, we're lunch and dinner seven days a week, uh, open at 11 and close at 9 on Sundays, 10 on Monday through Thursday, or quit serving food at 10, and uh, quit serving food at 11 on Friday and Saturday nights. So, so 11 we, to 11 weekends. When you close at 11, that means that uh, the work really ends around one thirty or 2, I would, I would suspect. Yes, when we say close, we take our last seating at 11 oh, right. or at 10 when, during, earlier in the week so that people come in at you know, 10 o'clock, that we still seat them, serve them, alcohol. We don't, you know, the bar is still open. Uh, and we, close, we close the bar kind of when the customers leave. Now, uh, blue agave it, isn't that a an ingredient in tequila? Well, blue agave is the plant or cactus that tequila is made from. So, the better tequilas, I'll say, one hundred percent blue agave. In order to be called tequila, you have to have at least fifty one percent of blue, made from blue agave. All right. 
Give us a call. I bet a lot of people out there eat Mexican food, <laughs> like half, uh, excuse me, 98% of Houston. Uh, give us a call at 713-526-5738, extension 2, to talk. And you can ask Charlie Watkins, owner of Blue Agave Restaurant, a question about Mexican food or let him know what you really like about uh, about your Mexican food experience. I'm going to go way back to the 60s, the Wayback Machine, and there was a restaurant called Felix Mexican Restaurant on on Westheimer, east of Montrose, I think. Since then, Mexican food has really come a long way. Can, can you fly us over that that seven, 60 or 70 years of history in the Mexican uh, restaurant business in Houston? And end up where you are now at Blue Agave. Well, I, the world knows Mexican food as what's truly Tex-Mex, which started both in San Antonio and Houston mostly. So depending on what aspect, uh, Tex-Mex, I think, originally kind of came out of San Antonio, uh, from my understanding. But then when the nymphas came along, Mama Nympha, she put fajitas on the map. Nobody had done fajitas, mm-hmm. and she made it which now worldwide popular. So between Houston, you know, all of Texas and northern, nor, some of northern Mexico, but created Tex-Mex, which is uh, its own cuisine in and of itself. Each little area of Mexico, Oaxaca, Mexico City, Yucatan, uh, Pacific Coast, have their own varieties of Mexican mm-hmm. food or the – you know, specialties, and which were quite different from Tex-Mex. Have you traveled a lot in those areas and, and gotten uh, gotten a sense of what people really eat uh, in, in those regions? Not all of them. I've been to quite a few. I've been to Mexico City uh, many, many times and lately been eating at their high-end restaurants. They have two of the top 50 restaurants in the world in Mexico City, uh, which I've been down to eat in the last year. Uh I go to the Yucatan a lot, so I've eaten hmm. a lot of the Yucatan mm-hmm. food. Uh, but I plan on doing some trips to Oaxaca, uh, which I have not been soon, because Oaxaca is the most famous of the Mexican cuisines. In- interesting, interesting. Uh, we actually, we have a caller, um, and uh, let's, let's put our caller on and, and hear the question. Certainly. Uh, caller, you were on the air. Uh, you were on the air with Charlie Watkins. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Jamonica Phoenix. Hey. Hello there, Jamonica. How are you doing, Charlie? I'm oh, doing Jamonica. awesome. Thank you for calling in. Yeah, and I just sent a text to Lyle and Wee, and they said they'd been out to your new place um, a couple of months ago, maybe? Anyway, my question was, was is, what's the best thing to order? Oh, that depends on what's your favorite. If you're uh, seafood, uh, if you like fajita, our fajitas, I think are, if not the best in Houston, up up there uh, fighting at it. We age our beef sixty days, and it's sirloin uh, flap, which is one of the top quality meats you can use for fajitas. There's three cuts, uh, inside skirt, outside skirt, and sirloin flap. We use what I consider the best, and then we age it. So we have really, really nice fajitas, and the marinade's quite important. All the details that go with it. What's your favorite? Um, I, I do love fajitas, but I also love seafood, and I love ceviche. Ooh, our ceviche is one of my specialties. I love our ceviche. Then I'm going to have to make time to come out there. I've been really busy with music and other things, fundraisers and things like that, but I'm definitely going to have to come out there. Yeah, I do. What's the best time to come when it's not really busy? Well, earlier in the week is less crowded. Uh, Weekends Mm -hmm. can be uh, quite full, uh, especially the weather. We have a we have a huge outdoor patio that can seat hundreds of people, and when the weather's great, it tends to fill up. Uh, but we have nice air conditioned inside that seats 150 or so. So, uh, your choice. And, and when are you there? I'm there usually Most- some lunches and some dinners, uh, every day. <laughs> I, I, I have other every things day. I do. I, I have, yeah. uh, 
really good management and stuff, so I take off periodically. But I'm there most any time for lunch or dinner. Well, I would love to catch up with you more. And definitely come try some of your delicious food. It's always been fantastic. All your restaurants have always been great. Well, thank you very much. I've been in the business a long time. Oh, I know. What was the one that you first started off of? Of of, uh, San Felipe in there near Bering? No, Woodway and Bering, uh, Cafe Toulouse. Uh, oh, my God. I, opened, I remember I that. that. I opened that in 89. Oh, my, my goodness. Started there. That was that was my first experience. And then Lyle, of course, took us along to all of your other restaurants. Yeah, Lyle's, that, they were, they were. yeah Lyle did come out just recently. First time I'd seen him in a long time. He's a great guy. Yes, he is. Old friend. I, I, I actually, he, he came out and uh, I was on a – trip he got me to bring him another buddha he likes buddhas yes he does <laughs> i think we've all added to his collection it's getting harder to find a unique one but we keep looking <laughs> there you we go keep looking. yeah well charlie it was really great to talk to you i listen to kpft all the time I, i'm a sustaining member thank you um we thank you very much listening. and this this was wow uh very nice to to catch up and Put a place on my list. I don't. I don't get out, out to eat as much as I used to, but I'd certainly go to a lot of live music, and well, I will make it a point to come out to Blue Agave. Well, I have a, a duo that sings on Thursday nights and Saturday nights that are awesome. Really? And then I've got a Sunday jazz duo that sings from one to four. Oh, really? That's excellent. To know. So, if you like live music, we've got a couple, oh, well, three different days that'll suffice. I just jotted that down so that um, a duo on Tuesdays and Saturdays. No, Thursday, Thursday. Th- Thursdays and Saturdays. And then yeah. jazz brunch on Sunday. Yeah, Latin jazz and then Latin. They can play anything, but they tend to play more Latin music since we're a Mexican restaurant. That sounds fantastic. Th- thank you for the great call. Sure appreciate it. I hope you make it on out there and uh, oh, to, sure. have, to have some great Mexican food. Oh, uh, watch out. Look forward to seeing you. Charlie, uh, fajitas. Now, when you go to the store and you get, there's flank ska- uh, steak and there's skirt steak. Is that what's actually in a fajita? Or or you, I'm interested that you purchase it and age it. Or do you age, do you purchase it aged or, because uh, I love flank steak. It's one of my favorites. I, I eat it just straight. Right. No, uh, I, I have a, special uh warehouse section with one of my suppliers that we purchase everything and put it in there and age it in their coolers so uh that, so that makes it easier for me i in the past i've aged all my own meat in mm-hmm. in house at my restaurants but i don't have enough walk in cooler space I'll at this at this restaurant to do it so it took me a while but i made a special deal with uh, one of my suppliers and they've been really great uh put a word out for performance foods for giving me my own cooler space now when you have fajitas it's hard to not order a margarita i mean i guess you can order a (laughs) corona or a bohemia but i prefer to order a margarita how did it happen that margaritas and fajitas got paired together as uh, just one of the ultimate dining pairs oh good question uh I know a little bit of the history of margarita itself, how it got paired with fajita. I'm not sure that's uh, documented as well, but it's a great, great pairing. Everybody loves margaritas and with their fajitas. Uh, margaritas, a couple of things on the history of margarita. One is that Jose Cuervo uh, created it marketing in California, but that's not very well accepted. The accepted version of margarita is a guy named Morales who was – at a bar in Mexico and he made specialty cocktails and they were famous for all these specialty cocktails. And a lady walked in one day and said, could you fix me a Magnolia? And he goes, sure. And he made, made up, you know, he didn't know what it was, but he just made a drink up cause he'd never seen her before. And, uh, he created this drink and he handed it to her and she goes, that is fantastic, but it's not a Magnolia. And he went, Oh, I thought you said margarita. Uh, that's our margarita. Do you want me to do something else? Oh, no, no. This is incredible. So it went on, and uh, 
became became very very popular and uh, at the restaurant and popular with everybody and obviously worldwide popular now. And later he married a girl who happened to be named Margarita. So people think it's after his wife's name, but it was mm-hmm. actually the flower of magnolia that he was asked to drink for. But anyway, funny story. Well, margaritas are great. Now, when you operate a restaurant, the I've heard, and that's why I'm so interested in having a, a restaurant expert on the show like you, that alcohol, alcohol sales make up a significant portion of the margin of a restaurant. Uh, can you visit a little bit about that? First of all, is that true? And can you visit a little bit about that? Yes, um, it's an interesting question. Uh for sure, alcohol is a very important part of profitability of restaurants and sales in restaurants. In general, most restaurants have about 30% sales of alcohol hmm. to food. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a good average going around. And the profit is probably more than 30%, you know, more higher. I don't know exactly the numbers for everybody because everybody's different. But it's a little bit of a misconception that The cost of alcohol is why you make so much money. You do have a better uh, product cost on alcohol, uh, but alcohol also takes a lot less labor. One bartender can put out thousands of dollars for the drinks where Mm. it takes – and they work mostly on tips, whereas the kitchen takes, you know, four, five, six people to put out thousands. So you have a much better labor cost in the bar as well as uh, product cost. Now – I heard from an attorney friend who worked with the the Alcohol Commission, and I'm unfamiliar with all that regulatory stuff, but when you go to um, Total Wine or Specs and you buy a bottle of vodka, you're paying, oh, say, $35. And I don't buy vodka, but let's say scotch, where you might pay $45 for a, you know, a 12-year-old Glenlivet. Maybe it's 55 I understand, I understand that restaurants pay like a hundred and pay way, way, way more than that to have the tag that gives them the ability to sell. In other words, y'all pay a lot more than what I, as a consumer, would pay when I walk into a uh, um, a liquor store. Is that is that correct? Not exactly. We end up paying a lot more in the taxes that are added on on our end. Right. Right. So our our actual cost. At, from the distributor is very similar. Okay. But we then have to add uh, roughly 15% on, which used to be all paid by the restaurant. Now it's split half and half because half of it's uh, eight and a quarter sales tax, which we collect from the customer, which has been in effect four or five years now. Okay. But before that, it was 14% completely paid by the restaurant. So when you multiply out the bottle that let's say costs you $35 and then you sell it at you know 20 drinks at $10 that's $200 times 14% tax right right that is that you know you have or now 15% but we anyway it can it definitely costs us a lot more than okay well so but I had a misapprehension that it was like double or triple uh, not really. But now from the sales standpoint, the state benefits massively from that, right? Because you're really kicking in a lot of money to the state for sales tax revenues well, and alcohol revenues. In, in some areas, the state is extremely smart, and especially in collecting taxes. So they, <laughs> they, they charge the tax at the highest possible rate So because you can only tax once. So they, everybody is excluded from tax all the way down until the product gets to its most expensive level, then it's taxed. Right, right, right. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, actually, we have a song of uh, about from Blue Agave that I'd like us to play. Uh, if we could go ahead and take our first musical break, let's play the Blue Agave theme song. Sounds good. So we end our very best Mexican dinner You don't need to go to old Mexico Just follow me to the blue agave Bring your hot senorita for a cold margarita Just follow me to the blue agave Blue agave, blue agave all right, there we go. Very good, very good, Charlie. Excellent, excellent. Funny story to that song. My mother wrote that. 
Oh, hey, hey. my mother wrote that, and she got my cousin Marlo Blue uh-huh. to record it, and then took me aside one day and says, "Son." I wrote a commercial for your restaurant. This is the original Blue uh-huh. Agave on West Gray. She go, and I went, what? And she goes, just listen. And she puts the tape in and plays it for me. And I'm like, wow, Mom, you did that? She goes, yeah, and your cousin sang it. It's great. It's great. I love it. Uh, we have Marlo answering the phones. We have Heather as our board operator today. And Rico is assisting. So we have quite a crowd here. And I happen to know Charlie's mother, wonderful lady, um, great memories of, of her. And uh, so anyway, we're all pleased to be here. Great song, great song. Uh, all right, now, now we were visiting about, uh, about alcohol in, in restaurants. And, you know, this is a business show, and I would talk about the menu the whole time if I could. And, and we're going to return to the menu because I have a bunch of questions. Uh, and, but uh, tell me about how, uh, how many people it takes to run a large restaurant like, like you have. It, you know, it's, it sounds like it's uh, like 15,000 total square feet, you know, inside. Is that right, 15,000? or? No, well, in, inside, no, we're probably about s- Six seven thousand inside, but I've got like a twenty thousand square foot patio. Uh, twenty seven thousand square feet. That's a lot of area. That's a lot of space. It is. I mean, if you had that enclosed as a warehouse, you would be. You couldn't throw a ball all the way to the end. It's that big. Uh, so how, or at least I couldn't. Not with my arm. <laughs> so how many people does it take to handle that 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 larger restaurant? I run with about thirty employees. Okay, thirty. Okay, and and so in you said in uh, I hadn't thought about this before, but uh, a a bartender can really churn out the revenues just by himself, but to put together these complicated dishes takes um, uh, you know takes more people, takes more effort. It's more of a more of a production process. Uh, how many people are like are, are in the kitchen? Well, the the. Obviously, that depends on you know Monday night, Friday night, but the the kitchens usually staff with, let's say six or seven people on the line. Mm-hmm. Then you've got a food expediter, you got food runners, you got dishwashers, mm-hmm. you got you know a lot of people helping out with everything. Prep cooks, people have to come in in the morning and prep and mm-hmm. then, you know mm-hmm. clean up and getting everything out. So you know depending on the night. You know, on a on a slow night, you might be able to run with uh, three or four okay. people. And uh, and Mexican food is high labor. You got a lot of rolling each enchilada to order, everything right. like that. So it's it's not um it's not as easy to put out as some restaurants. Like a steakhouse, one one cook can put out a lot of steaks because he's just putting mm-hmm, it on mm-hmm. and turning them. Whereas you know, like an enchilada, you have to load all the ingredients in tortilla, roll it up, put it on, put the cheese on top, put it in, melt everything, heat it, come back, change plates, add beans. That Whereas a steak is much quicker and faster. So a steakhouse is generally lower labor than – much lower labor than a, rest, a Mexican restaurant in the kitchen anyway. Uh, do you have a dedicated meat cook? Oh, we have a lot of dedicated – I mean, we have an ded- enchilada station – Grill station, saute mm-hmm. station, mm-hmm. you know, uh, salad, desserts. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of stations in the restaurant. I see, I see. So that that now that is just the central area where everything is produced. Then, of course, you have the the bar where liquor is is you know packaged and produced. I guess that's the way to think about it. Then you have obviously the wait staff. And and like how many waiters would you have on a on kind of a busy night like a Friday night? On a on a busy Friday night, we usually have uh, nine to twelve. All right, okay. And then then you have bus people, well, then uh, plus bartenders, plus bus people, plus plus plus. Okay, and floor and managers, and then a, 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 a reception. You maybe have hostesses, two, two two to three hostesses on a busy night. It's a lot of, a lot of moving parts. It is, and and what's really critical in my mind, and I think not enough people do it, is to be sure you put a team that gets together and gets along and works together and helps each other. I, 
I've uh, always had a saying that I tell people when I hire them and, and train them is like, you divide my house, you're out of my house because I want a team that gets along and helps each other and everybody likes coming to work and has you know friends at work and you help each other. So I've been, it took me a while to learn that in my early days, but it's so important to have a great team and we do. We have a great team that gets along. Uh, I'll bet that you... When you need to leave the restaurant, like now, y'all are serving lunch, and oh, you're yes. here, and we appreciate that. But I assume you, you uh, well, since you're here, you must have real high confidence in your team that they can handle a bit, you know, a busy lunch uh, without your intervention and supervision. No, I have a I have a great team there, uh, from my manager Ann Alvarez, Alvarez to my cooks in the kitchen to my wait staff every everybody's really nice and dedicated when someone comes to you and says they'd like to be on your wait staff what uh how long have they usually been in the restaurant business and what are some of the some of their career paths or maybe some of the restaurants they've come from that you i would imagine that if someone came to you from ninfas just for example you would, you know, you would know a certain thing about them as to as to what they can do and how do you look at people who come to you for employment in in your restaurant? Well, obviously, we look at experience because that'll tell us a lot of of how much we're going to have to train them, mm-hmm. where they came from, what habits they have, how strict the uh, previous businesses they worked at. Or so, I mean, it's a very complicated thing. But the most important part is, you know, people who care, who are genuinely nice, and you can tell they take pride in what they do. That's the number one thing I look for. Uh, and it didn't matter if I'd be run if I was running a computer company or a restaurant. You want people who take pride in their work. I was thinking uh, about. Uh, Actually, two weeks ago, we were talking about different types of people, people who are interested in things and people who are interested in people. And I would think that uh, a, a person in, in, as a waitstaff person would, you know, would be interested in people. They would be interested in what they order. They would, they would kind of, you know, remember what the person ordered and kind of link that in their mind so it's part of, you know, they're interested in, in the people, not only just the order and, and getting it technically correct, but uh, but they would be interested in people and talking to people. Well, that's exactly right. The restaurant business is an entertainment business, and you need mm-hmm. people who love people because we are in the entertainment business. Obviously, we've got to get the food right, the drinks right, everything out on time. There's a lot of precision that has to come through. But bottom line, people come out to a restaurant to be entertained, entertained by great food, entertained by, entertained by great service, a happy atmosphere, You know, every, the be- restaurant being beautiful, friendly. You know, you go there for a great, happy experience. For sure. You want to have a good time. Um, uh, and, you know, the Mexican restaurant kind of culture in Houston has, has evolved to, to really be uh, just a, uh, uh, a real cultural, fun development. It's, it's really great. I, ju- I just love it. And uh, the, uh, I tell you what, give us a call at 713-526-5738, uh, extension 2, to talk to Marlo, and she will put us uh, put you on the phone with with Charlie Watkins, owner of Blue Agave Restaurant. Uh, now, a lot of times I think about um, when I think about businesses, I think about margins and the the cost of food, and where do you you know like you know without telling us necessarily exactly where you get the food what is the procurement process like in other words this food just ma- to to we customers this food just magically appears on our table but 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 there's a, you're smiling but a lot happens before that happens so how do you source your raw raw product I was laughing because uh, somebody once described a restaurant as as Christmas and Santa Claus because you ask for things and you get them. Uh Uh-huh, right, right, right. (laughs) I'd like this and you get it. Uh Uh-huh. So anyway, uh, now to procure food, there's different suppliers. You have your seafood suppliers, your meat suppliers. Sometimes people do both. You have dry goods. Uh, the bigger pl- companies like Cisco or whatever try to do do everything but end up ordering from – 
quite a few different companies. You have your liquor companies, your beer companies, mm-hmm. you know, uh, all sorts of specialty uh, companies that bring in everything to us. Now, I was I was attending a, a meeting with uh, with the manager of Brennan's, and he ma- he made what I thought was a shocking statement. He said, "We all order." our chicken breast at Cisco. What makes us special is that we provide a memory to go with that. <laughs> and what, what do you think about that? Who are you talking to? The, I, I forgot the guy's name. He was the manager at Brennan's and this was years and years ago. They've had a few, some of them are my good friends, but anyway, no, it, it, it's not everybody orders from Cisco. I, I don't particularly, uh, I mean, Cisco is a great company, but I have, uh, different suppliers, but, it is the experience, the the seasoning, the restaurant, the experience you go with it, how friendly and nice and quick your service was, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. all that. And then obviously the recipe. I mean, we do a lot of things to make our food very, very special. Uh, I, I graduated from chef school in Paris in 1982 and been cooking around the world for a long time. So I very much take a lot of pride in, in putting out great, great food. Look, tell that's very very interesting. Tell tell us a little bit about what is Chef School. Uh, I had never, you know, like what is that? Uh, what kind of course of study do you go through? And um, and have you done any other international stuff that's inter- that you know that is interesting? Because I hadn't thought. Gosh, this guy's been to Paris to study uh, cooking. Tell tell us about that. Well, you asked a lot of questions at once Sorry. there, but <laughs> no, no problem. So uh, I've always liked to cook since I was a little kid, and my aunt in New Orleans gave me Tony Chasseret's cookbook when I was, I don't remember, eight or ten years old, and I started making my own seasonings, or his, his seasoning, and then mine eventually, and learning to cook. And when I uh, got out of the university, uh, I majored in economics at Rhodes, Rhodes College. And uh, I worked for a couple of years in investment in real estate. And I just decided to go back and uh, go to chef school because in the investment world, you need cash flow. And Mm -hmm. restaurants can provide a lot of cash Mm -hmm. flow. So I decided, well, I love to cook. And if I'm going to be owning and managing restaurants, I need to be able to control the kitchen. So I went to chef school. I got a degree in Paris uh, at La Varenicole de Cuisine. Hmm. And I came back and I started working back in the investment world and, and in restaurants and started a, my first little place was a, a deli downtown called Tropics, which just sold sandwiches and yogurt and uh, hot dogs and things. And then I opened up a uh, Cajun restaurant hmm. called Charlie's Bio Ben on Memorial. Oh. And then in 89, I opened up my French restaurant, Cafe Toulouse. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. from there, uh, after that, I opened up Sierra Grill which became one of the top 10 restaurants in the United States. Hmm. It was on uh, Esquire magazine, put it top 10. New York Times wrote us up out of the blue and put us on the front page with uh, accolades everywhere. I ended up getting selected to do a lot of guest chef appearances around the world out of Sierra Grill. Fantastic. Fantastic. It's been a a great experience, and, and I luckily found out I'm an okay cook. I'll bet you are. I'll bet you're fantastic. Uh, the uh, I've a, it's you know it sounds like you've had such a wide variety of experience, and I've uh, attended several conferences where we uh, these were actually CPA conferences, and they, they, this is something no one would go to unless they had to. Uh, <laughs> and I had to take this training, but little, it would be a little, little torture. Well, it was a little bit torturous, but but we had a great lunch, and we would go into the. It, this was like imagine the Marriott, a huge, maybe eighteen hundred people, eighteen hundred people, and we would have a speaker, and the Marriott would bring out this lunch which would consist of maybe a small filet green beans mashed potatoes bread iced tea coffee all at once all at once have, how how are you familiar with that scale of operations or how would they do that i, I am i i've n- never 
you know, been a hotel chef, but I've done a lot of guest appearances with hotels and mm-hmm. worked, worked in hotels. I opened up uh, Hotel Beijing and uh, Beijing Tiananmen Square for the Chinese government. They oh, had wow. a new restaurant and flew me in to open that up for them in 97. I've done a lot of hotel appearances around the world, like five in Hong Kong and Norway and France and England and the Fantastic. States. But to answer your question more specifically, that is a art all of in itself. And I've, like, uh, one year we fed 800 people at the Aspen Food and Wine Festival in the middle of a field. And, wow. you know, we had to take everything out and do it. But you, it's a different form of organization than, than a restaurant. You you do a lot of things differently uh, that's a lot of fun as well. And it can, can, done right, be also really high quality. This was, this was really very, very good, and what surprised me was that it was so good and so well organized, and I could imagine one thing going wrong, and then the whole thing breaks down. And, of course, these are professionals who do this, but uh, um, any, anyway, very, very interesting. What, uh, now, now, we talked about ordering food, and I think kind of what you're getting at is that the – Part of the skill in ordering food from different suppliers is creating a unique experience in the restaurant, whereas you're not just ordering uh, 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 generic generic types of things. And, and that's, I think that's you know, probably super important. But how do you, how do, just in general, how do you think of pricing? Uh, now, we all go to a, we all, all of us who go to Mexican restaurants are kind of familiar with the general level of pricing. And, you know, of course, we don't want to be wildly surprised on the upside, but we kind of expect to know what we're going to pay. And, it, you know, it changes over time. It goes up over time. But how do you – what is kind of the philosophy of pricing? Well, pricing is is based on the market. So – and and it's also – I mean, if you want to get specifically like – uh Let's take a pasta restaurant or or, mm-hmm. or Italian restaurant. Uh, a pasta dish that maybe an appetizer that say, sells for ten dollars. That that uh, pasta may only cost them two dollars. So they have a five time markup. So that works there. But then again, they made eight dollars. Okay. So on a steak, the same restaurant, they may have that for let's say, you know, $50, mm-hmm. but that steak may have cost them 22 or so. So they made, okay. so they made, you know, $28. So they I mean, they have almost a 50, you know, almost just barely a two time markup instead of a five time markup. But instead of making $8, they made 20, $28. So on the pasta dish, we're thinking, wow, we're making five times our money, but it's only seven fifty. It's only, exactly. you know, it, it bar- uh, well, I don't know what that would pay, but but to have the kitchen staff, the wait, the wait person, you, you, know, you only, from that seat and that person at the table, you only contributed, you know, seven fifty eight dollars to pay on your cost on that dish, towards paying your light bill, paying all your employees, paying your cooks, paying everything else. You had a five hundred time markup, you know, but you only made, you know, like you say, eight dollars, seven fifty, depending on your cost, two dollars, two fifty. Uh, whereas on the steak, you had barely a, uh, one time markup, a hundred percent markup, just, just over that. But you had $28 to, at the prices I gave earlier to add to contributing to paying your light bill, paying your staff, paying your kitchen, everything. So pricing very v- varies depending on your cost and the price of the item. So, uh, so we all know, uh, all, those of us who shop, and I'm I'm a large, I'm a big meat person, so I, I shop for fajita, I shop for fillet, shop for sirloin and chuck, and and of course, sirloin, uh, excuse me, uh, fillet is is quite an expensive item. It's it's quite a bit per pound, so uh, so it makes perfect sense that if if someone sits down and orders a small steak, uh, a small you know say a six ounce fillet uh two margaritas a uh 
uh, and then asparagus or some. I'm just thinking of my ideal. Uh, now, this isn't a necessarily Mexi- Mexican experience, no, no, but, but I, I'm just pricing it. Dinner last night. It, well, you, well, that's pretty much <laughs> it. Uh, and the, but the if you double that, if you double the cost, you would really end up with a, a, a diner who where your margin could be. Thirty to forty dollars, or something along those lines. Like I said, it, everything, you know, it's a sliding scale. So, like on a really cheap dish, you might have a fairly large markup. Uh, on a more expensive dish, you have a very slight markup, uh, relatively speaking. But you still, on the more expensive dish, you contribute more money towards being able to pay your rent, pay your employees, pay your light bill. Your gross margin, as it were. Exactly. Now, for a table, uh, when you uh, when you think of a table of uh, usually, I would say, with Mexican food, I would think that a lot of people come in groups of four. Uh, is that true where you have groups of four to six where like a family will come and, you know, all, all be there at once versus a, a couple? No, Mexican food tends to come in larger groups. I mean, we, we have a lot of six tops, eight tops, ten tops, right. twelve tops, right. obviously four tops and two tops as well. But the large number of people, especially my restaurant, come in groups. I'll bet because it's it, it's kind of an event. It's kind of a you know get together and you know the cousins come into town and then we go to the to Blue Agave and you know have a great time. So uh, so it would not be unusual to have a uh, let's say if you had six people at a restaurant to have a two to three hundred dollar total total bill for for the for that particular table certainly uh, yeah yeah uh, uh fantastic fantastic to get back a little bit of question you asked earlier on purchasing uh obviously steak you have the grading of the steak and everything but mm-hmm. like one thing people don't uh know so much as like in chicken the age mm-hmm. of the chicken and most of these companies try and sell the older chickens because they get bigger and you know they have more money but the the young chicken has a much better t- taste, tenderness, and everything. So, you know, getting a good supplier of chicken that ha- has uh, the younger chicken, I don't know exactly the age on it, you mm-hmm. know, how many weeks or whatever is the proper age, but I do know the taste and that, and that, that is incredibly important. And so the cook may be just as good at one restaurant to the other, but if the purchaser is not purchasing the right chicken, the flavor won't be anywhere near as good. Interesting. Now I'm a big natural eater and the, a lot of what I've heard is that chickens who are and you know, I'm going to use the term free range, and I'm I'm a, very much an amateur. But the chicken who eats bugs and things that are out in a field and everything is is that a real thing, or it, is that marketing hype? No, it is a very real thing. The free range chickens taste much better mm-hmm. than than the caged chickens, and there's a there's a lot of uh, quality in it, both in fine things that are organic. Uh, free range, the quality of the product, not always is, you know, organic tastes better, uh, but generally, and not always, there's, there's so many factors in it and people get confused with just wanting unprocessed and, and organic, but those are definitely in general, far superior tasting food and healthier. Fantastic. Fantastic. What, uh, when you, uh, one thing I've always wondered about is uh, now it'd be hard to steer me away from a margarita at a Mexican restaurant, but for for the d- different types of liquor that are sold, how um, how is that margin? In other words, like if I order a uh, uh, Bohemia uh, a can Bohemia versus say a Carbach on tap versus uh, a Stella Artois bottle, and you know, I know I'm kind of at the low end there, but talk about how, please, how th- those margins differ. Well, margins are margins. You can only charge what everybody's used to. Right. So right. If everybody's charging, you know, if you're in a market out at a uh, 
place where they have a lot of ice houses and stuff like that, mm-hmm. where beer is mm-hmm. going for, you know, three, four dollars a bottle. That's all you can sell it for right, if you're right. if you're in that market. You can't say, oh, I want seven dollars. But like, whereas most restaurants are selling beer for you know five, six, seven, so mm-hmm. you can you get six dollars for a Budweiser or whatever at at a more of your high end restaurants, and mm-hmm. some of the top top restaurants will charge ten or whatever. But you have to be in that. You have to price at your market what everybody's expecting so you don't really get a choice you can't say oh i need you know a five-time markup on my beer to make any money i mean no you've got to charge what the market is expecting as high or as low and actually here i'm falling into your trap here of the lower not only it may be a higher margin but it's a lower total amount of money correct so if if i were to say have uh uh, scotch, which, which I'd say, well, I want a scotch, or versus I want a Glen Levitt scotch. When how how does that work from the restaurant owner standpoint? Well, the the more expensive items, again, you don't take as big of a markup on because you still get more money to pay for the uh, more total dollars with a lesser margin to pay for the rent electricity etc mm-hmm. but uh i'm not sure i mean it's a, it's the same exact all the way through food alcohol liquor if the higher the price the less the markup in general the lower the price the more the markup because you're still getting smaller dollars from there sitting in the chair and being at your restaurant so you're trying to everybody's got to pay their bills let me, uh, now what about uh, I'm a big fan of fish. You know, of course I like I like beef and but what how what fish offerings do y'all have? Because I usually go straight for beef offerings or chicken at, at Mexican restaurants, but uh, I've seen a lot of fish starting to be offered. And of course, I'm sure you've seen it for 20 years, but for me, it's kind of new. What what all do you all have for in fish? Well, we we do a uh, several different fishes, but one salmon, which we do on a fajita setup. So we grill salmon and then put it in the fajita setup. So it's not salmon fajitas exactly, but it's a salmon fillet served with the fajita setup and the, the grilled onions, the charro beans, black beans, uh, pico de gallo, things like that. So. Um, that's there. We also have snapper done several ways. Mm-hmm. We have a, a tuna crudo taco I just added on the menu. So hmm. if you if you're and but everybody's liking uh, tuna crudo these days or sashimi tuna done and stuff. So we we have a just added a few weeks ago a sh- uh, sashimi tuna taco, and then we do shrimp tacos. We have a really incredible shrimp brochette. So we do mm-hmm. quite a, quite a few different s- seafood items. Those sound fantastic. I I love salmon, and I actually cook it all the time myself. I grill it. Now the sashimi tuna is that that's uh, a sushi tuna. Isn't that seared just on the outside, or or is it? No, sashimi is is just completely raw. Okay. Tataki is seared on the outside okay. and raw on the inside. So tataki you is a Japanese term for where you keep the fish uh, or meat extremely cold. You put it on the grill just to sear the outside, but it doesn't penetrate very hard in. Maybe an eighth of an inch in, and the whole rest of the meat is raw. Fantastic. Like that's called tataki. But no, this is just a uh, sashimi tuna. And do you serve? And how do you serve that? Do you serve it sliced on a, on a on a board? Well, it's cut up into cube. No, it's it's done into a taco. So we do oh, okay. we do a taco. We have it. It's kind of a really fun uh, taco because it's got. Uh, I do a soy marinated onion in there with the avocado and the lettuce and everything. So you've got the classic. Uh, salt flavor of soy and with your tuna taco but then i do a tequila lime vinaigrette on the side that you can pour over it we've got another lime so you can do you can kind of make each bite a little different uh on it it's two tuna tacos it's been been really popular since i put it on <laughs> that sounds absolutely fantastic uh, i've never heard of the well i've never heard of the idea of serving salmon in a fajita setup that sounds really really interesting so so uh 
uh, people would, uh, I guess you would slice that so people could make tacos of that with, with the, you know, with the uh, guacamole, the onion, et cetera. Yeah, you can eat it as a filet of, tuna, of salmon or you can make it into a tortilla, tacos, wrap it up. It's, it's got all the setup to go either which way. So it's a really fun dish. And salmon's just a great fish. Uh, some people don't like it, but most people just love salmon. It's one of my favorite fish. I absolutely love it. It's 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 really great. Really very very healthy. Just such a healthy fish. Oh, it's it's definitely one of the most healthy things you can eat. Exactly, exactly. When uh, do you taking from health? P- people who go to a Mexican restaurant for that period of time, they suspend their worry about calories or or you you know they're not saying you know here i'm here i'm really gonna kick my diet into high gear as i walk into a mexican restaurant but how do you how do you kind of think about uh what you know what you present on the plate in in terms of of the health of the of the food well i'm i'm very concerned with everything being of high high quality but going back to that issue that's in the menu for me i've always tried to provide a variety so there's i I don't like specialize in something vegan or anything but i've Mm -hmm. always got something vegetarian on the menu Uh, there there's always ways to make everybody happy because if you've got one person in a group who's a vegan and uh they're going out seven other people who are not want you know enchiladas and everything else you have something on there to make them happy too and then you do it right you do it well where it's really tasty so whether you're just in the mood for this dish or you know for something vegetable or what you always want to have everything so you want to have seafood you want to have meat you want to have something vegetarian that because there's a group of eight people chances are somebody wants something different for sure it sounds to me like you have um, a full plate with with this one restaurant. Have you ever uh, operated multiple restaurants in the same city? And and what would that look like to your lifestyle or to someone who is contemplating opening, or someone who say owns one restaurant and says, "Oh, I'm going to open another restaurant." What what does that do to your uh, time and lifestyle and the quality of what you're offering? Well. It it depends on what kind of team you can put together. I've had multiple restaurants uh, over the years, and it's all about having good teams. If you've got the right personnel and you can put the right teams together and manage them and systems, you need the right systems mm-hmm. for them to follow. You need good people. And with all that, it's easy. Putting that together, not necessarily so easy. <laughs> uh, uh, for this may be a question that no one is interested in but me, but how how does the back office accounting of a restaurant system uh, of a restaurant work? Is it a is it a a package an integrated package you buy, or is it a software as a service thing, or have uh, are you happy with what you're operating with now? Uh, how does how does that work? Because a lot of money is going back and forth all the time. No, you you have to have very very tight controls and very good accounting. There's a lot of ways to do it. There's a lot of software out there, but basically you need a really good CPA and you mm-hmm. need to do inventories at minimum once a month and mm-hmm. match out everything. If you have a problem, then you start doing inventories once a week and fix your problem, find out what, what's going wrong. But you need to know your bottom line. You need to know what's happening, and you need to know it in detail so you can fix the problems and find them. Otherwise, you w- work for nothing. Right. Very interesting. Now, we've had discussions here on the show about cash versus credit cards. What is uh, – is it – Something that you're uh, is that something that are you just concerned more about getting the sale and having a happy customer, or do you feel like when you receive cash you are you are better off by the three percent, or do you really care? I I focus on making a happy customer. So I've got some friends in the business that don't accept cash because it's more of trouble for them to deal with. Mm-hmm. Some other people I know do only cash. I I think customer comes first so i take 
credit card, cash, you know, whatever they want to pay with. Well, ca- yeah. you know, ca- I've been to some restaurants where they don't accept cash, and and you know, cash is like legal tender. So, but but the uh, seems like it should be illegal. <laughs> <laughs> illegal cash? No, um, illegal to not accept cash. Cause the bill says this is legal tender for all debts. It does say that. Yeah, it does say yeah, that, yeah. doesn't it? But a lot of people do it. They don't. They don't accept cash. But I, I'm I'm kind of mystified by that. But but I can understand the convenience of credit cards and and for, from the waiter's standpoint, I really appreciate them when they will split a bill and that type of thing. And I guess that gets down to your uh, accounting system, how easy that is to do, and to make it easy for the customer to, you know, to pay uh you know pay in a manner yeah, that's pay convenient how they, to pay them. how they want to pay and divide things up so uh so we're, we're almost finished let's let's just uh wrap up about uh blue agave uh it uh blue agave is on high um highway six and and i-10 at 14555 grisby road and uh it's one block South of I-10, one block east of Highway 6. So if you're going out I-10, you're going to hook a U. Hook a U. Hook a U at, at, uh, at Highway 6. Or hang a U-E. Hang a U-E at Highway 6. Take a right. Take, take, it- take your first or second right. The second right will come right up my driveway. All right. I'll, be- I'll bet that's a great area to operate a restaurant. It's a, it's a uh, big, uh, um, uh, you know, a hugely populated center, and I know people out there are hungry for the for the great food you provide. Uh, what else? What else we got with uh, with uh, Blue Agave? Well, I mean, aside from the really awesome food that Blue Agave serves, it is really one of the most beautiful properties in Houston. The outdoor gardens, the patio, the in, the inner restaurant. It uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful restaurant, and then. Uh, I personally think the Mexican food is some of the best in Houston, if not the best. We have Charlie Watkins, owner of Blue Agave Restaurant. Give him a visit. Charlie, we appreciate your discussion no. of the uh, of the restaurant industry. Great work. Thank you so much for coming out and talking to us. No, thank you very much, and thank you, Houston. Next week, Thursday at noon. <laughs> <laughs>